Uh, I'm an Australian guy living here in Belarus. And if you've watched a lot of my videos, you'll know that I'm a bit of a fan of this place. Like, I think it's pretty underrated in general, the culture and the people in particular. But I have to say, I don't recommend visiting here. Can you imagine? I'm telling you not to visit. Why am I telling you not to visit? Well, I think in Belarus, it's a, it's a high functioning society, right? It's pretty much a first world country, pretty close to it in most respects. However, there isn't a lot to do here for tourists. There's some stuff, you know, maybe you'd fill a week. You might go down to Brest and Grodna for maybe a day each. They're kind of closer to the Polish and, and also Lithuanian border in the case of Grodna. Get some kind of different architecture down there, some old churches and da 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 da. You can come up here to Minsk, maybe check out the cafe culture, National Library, Corky Park, whatever else. I don't know what's touristy here really. A uh, couple of days, maybe go somewhere else, have a bit of a look. But there's not a lot of stuff here that's going to be different from what you've experienced, other than the culture. And that, of course, you can't really witness in a few days of being a tourist. You need to actually uh, live here. Of course, anywhere you go on holidays, you're going to kind of enjoy it, right? Because you're on a holiday. Like, you're supposed to enjoy it. You get great customer service. You think the local culture is amazing because, you know, the lady at the cafe is really nice. The receptionist is nice. And, you know, you get a feeling that people are nice, but you never really interact with them, to be fair, when you're on a holiday. Not in a meaningful way, for the most part, anyway. So I think to get the benefits of Belarus, which is, again, the things work well. Like, stuff functions well. It's a pretty high-functioning society. And the culture is quite nice as well. People are quite genuine and um, there's a lot to be said for the people and the culture here. To get the benefits of those things, you can't just kind of blow in for a week or two and really totally appreciate that. So I would say to you that if you wanted to come to Belarus just for a week or two, I would say don't bother. There's nothing really to do here that's out of the ordinary, yeah? Belarus is functional. It works, it has all the basics down pat, nothing that is really unique and different no real draw card to belarus so unless you want to live here unless you like the idea of maybe settling down having a family here or whatever it is that you're interested in, makes you interested in belarus um unless you're going to come here for a long period of time just don't bother coming here. all right it turns out that was a pretty short video what i'm going to do now is just walk home so i've just been to my university just had a haircut and i'm just going to walk home now so i'll turn the camera around and if you want, you can just see what I see, and I'll just kind of talk you through it. So this is a bit of B-roll, as I just indicated. And we're headed south here. This is Prespakt uh, Nezavizi Mosti. This is like the major uh, thoroughfare, north-south. It's got about three lanes north, three lanes south, the looks of it. So Coffix, if you're in town, Coffix, it's like this kind of express coffee shop. And I'm stopping here because I like this one. I often get the latte uh, Cocos Lavender. So coconut lavender, as you can tell also from the photo. You get the Bolshoi one, the Bolshoi Bolshoi for 5.5 rubles, which is around two US dollars for what must be a double size, if not triple size coffee. So I get that almost every day. That Belarusian milk is delicious. Now I'm aware there's a lot of background noise here because I'm on the main street. But I will try my best to speak loudly so you can hear me. I'll move a little bit away from the side there. What I'll do is I'll go this way. I could go under there and then pop up on the other side there and walk. Because ultimately I'm going that way. I live up there. But I'll take you on this side. And then we can go down underneath uh, Victory Square Metro where there might be some more people wandering around. A few more signs of life. But you can see nice and sunny on the other side there. Over here, a bit chilly. It's a beautiful sunny autumn day. Has been kind of uh, dark and gloomy for the last little bit. But now, no. Beautiful sunny day. And you can feel the vibe pick up. It's a very mood driven culture. Belarus is a very mood driven culture, right? People have a mood and then that's them for the week. That's pretty much how it works here. So, um, uh, people can turn on a dime. So yesterday, people were kind of closed and snarling and don't want to leave the house. Today, with some sun, people are bouncing. People bounce out of bed. Can't wait to get along with the day. It's kind of interesting. I mean, every culture works like this to some extent, right? Obviously, but here I feel like it's under uh, under the microscope. It's, it's 10x, you know? It's 10x what a normal culture would be. Or the average culture would be. There's no normal culture, obviously, but um, the average culture. 
So you might know from some previous videos of mine, this is Victory Square Monument. If you go straight down there, you'll hit the city centre, although technically this is still the city centre. If you remember my video about Lee Harvey Oswald, he lived in this building here. Go back through my catalogue of videos, I talk about him, his experience here in Minsk. This is the guy who shot JFK, right? So he was given refuge briefly by the Soviets uh, before doing this. And then he got bored here in Minsk and moved back to America and then shot JFK. So the legend goes. Of course, there's many different versions of what happened and the motivations and who was involved and so forth. You can pick your favourite version and go with that. So you do get a lot of World War II monuments uh, here in Belarus because Belarus really copped it, man. In World War II, it just got flattened, really, for the most part. Very few buildings survived. So a lot of monuments were built post-World War II, about World War II, to remember not just the loss of infrastructure, but the loss of people. Like, you're looking at pretty much every able-bodied man from, uh, you know, 20 to 40 or whatever was dead, right? So the ones that remained were maimed, missing a leg, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's tough, tough stuff. Lots of electric scooters around the place. Look up here, you must have 15 sitting here. So you can see what happens. This is the metro stop here, right? So we need this little red M here. Tells you there's a metro coming up. And next to the metro, you can see people leave their little scooters. So they get off the train, come up here, get a scooter, maybe go home or to university or to work, bring it back and uh, dump it back uh, here again. Let's go down, we'll go underneath here and we'll take a walk. I'll go the back way, I usually go the front way where the metro station itself is. I'll go the back way. There's a lot of memorial stuff there, because of course this is a memorial monument kind of a, a metro stop. So I'll go the back way just to show you uh, what's there. And pay respects to that whole generation. Yeah? It's incredible to think uh, how wars were back in those days. It was just drop bombs everywhere and the whole city's dead. You know? um, some crazy stuff. I've seen some stories last night. My friend was telling me about uh, um, her grandparents and people in the grandparents' village. How when the Nazis came through, they uh, kind of all hid in the village. Um, oh, sorry, hid in the hid in the forest. Should I say they were in the village? They hid in the forest. Nazis came through and burned all their houses. And uh, there was one house remaining, and they all had to live in that house. And then as things got better, they uh, all lived in the one family's house. So whatever, ten families maybe in one family house. And uh, as time went on, they just slowly built an extra house for each uh, person, each family. You know? So they kind of worked together uh, to build all of their friends and families uh, additional houses. In the meantime, they just slept in the one house that was still there in the village that didn't get burnt down. Some pretty intense imagery here. Imagery. What I might do, I've never actually gone up in the centre here. There's a, a few things going on in the centre here. I might just go up there. Over here. This is 1941 uh, to 1945. So I've wanted to do a meaningful video on this specific topic for a while and the impact it's had on the culture as well. I wanted to do this for some time. Um, this is interesting. This is, oh wow. So obviously the names are in Russian, but they're actually in English alphabetical order. So it's, it's actually earlier in the alphabet than R, but R in English is in that order. That's an interesting one. Yeah, I wanted to do a bit more uh, about this. Um, the information I give on this topic is hearsay. So when I speak to Belarusians, they tell me things, I kind of repeat them to you guys without having done my own research. So um, 
before I leave, I'll do some more research, get some more hard data. So this is uh, Victory Square Monument and the Eternal Flame. So you can probably uh, guess what that means uh, in terms of eternal flame. Eternal for the country, eternal for the culture, eternal for the people. It's fairly obvious. Um, and also eternal, probably, for the spirit of those people and that whole generation that kind of got wiped out. You often see a lot of performances here. I've lived just one block away from here for the last six months. So I've seen a lot of uh, performances and festivals and stuff Ooh, take place uh, in this particular spot, right in the middle here. It's like a big roundabout in the middle of Prospect. Prospect is a busy mosque. We just came from up there, by the way. We're walking on that side, right in the middle here. Pretty heavy stuff. Just the absolute labour-intensive slaughter that was World War II. I mean, even a lot of Australians died. I think, I think my friend said 3% of our population died. Um, and a lot of my relatives did. One of my two generations up from me. It's kind of young guys uh, taken from some rural parts of Victoria, Australia and just kind of plonked on the front line and butchered. It's pretty friggin' horrific. top there 41 to 45 and the eternal flame difficult not to feel some kind of emotion to be honest it's quite difficult to observe this and just imagine what happened just throughout the country you know and just the the reckless death like even now obviously there's things happening around the world but you don't have this mass carnage you know you don't have like literally a quarter of the population killed on either side you know how a country even picks itself up after having uh, pretty much every able-bodied man killed. I mean, it's incredible. And, uh, yeah, that's what happened here. I mean, one of my, well, my first teacher, young girl, she proudly said that women built Belarus. And there's a truth to that, of course, they did. Uh, but, you know, also men died for it. But, yeah. the swastika there. Some actual photos of this site. Oh wow. Four hundred thousand Red Army soldiers. My goodness, that's a lot. It's an incredible number. I mean, Belarus. I don't know how many people it had then, but it has nine million now. So there would have been a lot less then. It's a lot of participants. Here's the monument where we are now. So it was mounted May 9th, 1945. So they got the memorial up pretty quickly. The 
ceremony 1954. So we have uh, glory to the fallen heroes, Soviet army during the Great Patriotic War, partisans of Belarus. I will, after that, uh, head home now. And I will, at some stage, as I say, uh, do a video specific to this topic. I think it's, uh, I mean, it's very central to the identity of Belarus, you know, uh, that the culture that's here now, this is not a planned culture, it's not a culture from 100 years ago, it's a culture with a lot of scarring on it from both the Soviet Union and also these events just discussed then of the uh, killing of just so many young men. Um, I think someone said that half the men died. Half of the males died, which would be probably every male 20 to 50, right? Effectively. <clears throat> Here's my favorite car again. Yeah, just finishing up on that topic. So, yeah, I mean, uh, Belarus is a very unique culture. It's got big effects from a whole lot of places. And one of them is definitely that it was a woman-heavy country for many, many years. This has had a long-term effect that still is in the culture now. Like, still, a lot of women have learned to be women from their super mums, you know? And their super grandmas who had to do everything on their own because there was no men. They had to produce the potatoes, they had to raise the children, they had to etc, cetera, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, right? And this is now in the culture that a lot of women are just like this by default. Um, and don't kind of know how to get married or what the purpose of a man is, you know? So interesting kind of thing here. So as I say, there's a lot of scarring in this country, a lot of cultural scarring. And scarring doesn't have to be a bad thing necessarily. It just means that there's you know, a memory left and in a significant influence left so it's not like a basic kind of a Christian country or whatever right that's not what's happening here it, there is a little bit Christianity has some strength here for sure um, but it still has again these cultural uh, overhang significant cultural overhang not as little things you know significant things um, that are really shaped what the culture is today because Belarus is a very unique culture a lot of unique influences here. It's not a stable, long-term cultural model that's still here from 100 years ago or 200 years ago. It's, it's not like that. It's this unique culture uh, built through, largely through a couple of these large historical events. Now, this car, <laughs> my favourite car, this thing, I don't know the story behind this. I'd love to know it, though. If you know it, tell me. Because this thing shows up parks it's parked in this spot three or four times at least and it sets up here for maybe a week or so and then it goes it vanishes again and i've seen it shown up a few time on uh times on karl marx street uh, you can see here it looks like they're putting in some kind of party moss party staff to try to limit the corrosion and we have some cards here all right, let's check this out. What's happening here? Obviously, it's a bit of a self-appointed. So they've got an Instagram there. I might hit up the Instagram. Let me get that in focus. Over there, guys. There we go. I might hit up the Instagram. Maybe find whose car it is. In fact, you know what? That's exactly what I'll do. That's very clever. I'll take this with me. And I'll hit this guy up. Assuming it's a guy. Probably a safe assumption to make. It looks like it's a mainly American themed car. We've got the burger on the antenna there. We've got the uh, chicken on the gear stick. Oh, there's even a number there actually. Trump Nation. Bad, blah, blah, blah. So we've got donations here. Donate for grandpa's car restoration. Oh, so it might be his grandfather's car. That's what we're going to assume, potentially. Interesting. All right, I'll hit the guy up on Instagram, see what I find. 
I kind of assumed that maybe they, they slept in here, but it doesn't look like it actually. In the back there's not enough room actually. So it seems to be actually more commercial than I thought. It seems to be actually parked here for deliberate promotion. Um, so I've lost a bit of interest in it for that reason. <laughs> but uh, I'll have a squiz anyway on, on IG and see what it's about. Unless you look like this. Don't lean on my car. Interesting. I mean, it could be even an American guy who bought his... Sorry about the focus. Um, could be even an American guy who bought the car over. I, I geez, a lot of Americans here. I'll tell you what, you'd be surprised. I mean, look, in general, there's not a lot of foreigners, not a lot of Americans, of course, but in the context of foreigners, there's a lot of Americans here. A lot of young Americans, a lot of young guys who are... Uh, that's very unusual for a car to go through like that. <laughs> they usually stop well in advance for you. Um, usually, yeah, uh, sorry, there's a lot of young kind of Christian guys here who are like, hey, I want to have a family. I just don't see that happening in America, so I'm here. You get this kind of guy, you get kind of the older guy as well. There's a lot of guys here from America, I have to say. Um, yeah, I, I guess not surprisingly. I mean, they do make up a lot of the Western population, just the numbers-wise. So that could be a guy. I had a guy the other day. I was approached uh, twice in one day, about three days ago. Um, but this guy didn't actually know me. So the first guy knew me, and he wanted to rant about something which I was not particularly interested in. Um, so I kind of sent him in his way because he's being a bit weird about it. Um, the second guy, he also wanted to rant, but just you know, because he wanted to rant, he didn't recognize me from this channel or anything. But he'd been here since 2016. So that's six years living here. He has his Belarusian wife. He has a son. He himself, I don't know how old he was. On the older side, like probably 50s, I would say, comfortably. Um, and he had quite a good rant to me as well. He was trying to start a, some kind of interviewing channel on, I think he said it was called StreamYard. Um, <laughs> um, he said it was called StreamYard. So this girl just put out her cigarette in the dry leaf bucket. <laughs> Not very smart. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he's been here six years, this guy. He just went over to a rant. Just whatever. Um, but yeah, another American guy. There's quite a few floating around with no social connections, which is interesting. Because foreigners, we kind of connect to each other pretty quickly, you know. If you meet a guy you like, you kind of go out with them and they might bring a mate of theirs and you bring a mate of yours and you network with people that are worth kind of networking with, right? Quickly, quickly. happens quickly. Uh, it's not like... If I came here and only wanted to speak with... Locals, it would take some time to integrate, and as it has, to meet local uh, guys to hang out with. But obviously when you're a foreigner, you're keen to make friends, right? You want to meet people and make friends. So people connect pretty quickly. But I've met several Americans who literally don't have a single friend here, and they've been here for many, many years. It's quite weird, actually, to be honest. It's quite unusual. Um, this guy here had no friends. Just his wife and his son. And he wants to start a, an interviewing thing. And I'm like, mate, there's, I could probably give you the number of 100 different guys here. It's like, I've only been here a year. What have you been doing? Like, what have you actually been doing for six years? I can't imagine having no friends. But as I say, I've met a couple of Americans like this. Mainly older guys uh, who are just here with their wife. And, and this guy didn't speak Russian either. Oh, it's kind of a weird situation. Anyway. You do get this in Belarus, you get some kind of uh, unusual characters, to say the least. you kind of got to be a bit unusual to be here, I think. Just generally speaking. Because it is a place that is hidden, you know. No one has even really heard of it. So just walking up here, almost at my apartment now going to walk up past one of my favourite coffee shops here on the left. There's definitely a good cafe culture here in Belarus. I will say this. Cafes are definitely uh, a thing. Hanging out, socialising, chatting. It's definitely a thing here. And although we're getting, as you can tell right from the leaves, 
We're getting deeper and deeper into autumn, which means we're coming out of that summer period. Nonetheless, people are still out a little bit anyway. But yeah, the cafes do empty out a little bit, but not all of them. Some of them stay busy in the winter because it is a bit of a social hub, you know. I think that uh, during the summer you have choices. Uh, in particular, the big parks you can go to to kind of socialise and chat and hang out. But in the winter, that kind of goes away a bit because it is kind of cold, as you might imagine. It does regularly get down to minus 15, minus 20 during January, February. Uh, I was lucky this year. Uh, February was very mild. I don't think it got to minus 20 or colder, which was very welcomed. Because apparently at minus 28, they shut down uh, everything. They shut down the town. Uh, you don't leave home if it's minus 28 maximum. And, uh, you know, classes are at home, work from home, stay at home. But that never happened. We never got one of those days. In fact, I'm pretty confident through the whole winter we didn't get much below about minus 15 as the maximum. Um, but you do notice it, that's for sure. I, I mean, I've lived through three North American uh, winters. And when I say North American, I mean at the close to the Canadian border of the US. And, uh, yeah, you kind of get used to it. It's not that big a deal. Yeah, yeah around that kind of minus 15 mark, it, you start to feel it on the face, you know. Feel it in your eyes. It's going to look nice and slow. I'm going to miss this green light. I look nice and slow. I'm trying to keep the camera steady for you guys. This is my street. This is my building here. My window's facing this street here. On the second level there, so you're not the ground level. I want the second one there. Facing out to the street. So it's quite a nice neighbourhood. It's nice and quiet, you know. And it's kind of near some major intersections, so it's easy to get to wherever you want to get pretty quickly in the Yandex, you know. Yandex being the, uh, probably no, Yandex is the Russian brand. Well, for kind of everything. Like, they're, they're Google here. So you can have, like, there's Yandex Maps. There's Yandex uh, operating like a, like an Uber or a Grab or a Bolt or a DD, depending where in the world you're from. Uh, so but I still kind of use the term taxi a little bit. As opposed to Yandex. Because Yandex is everything, as I say. Nice little e-scooter here. All right, I'm nearly home, so I'm going to say goodbye to you guys. Thanks for the chat. Thanks for the walk. There's not too many more nice days coming at me, so I'm probably not going to do much more of this walking around business. Uh, it's not as pleasant when it's windy and rainy, but I was saying that. Look, I, I didn't really dislike the winter here that much. It wasn't that bad. No? All righty. Um, if you enjoyed our chat today, do press like. Uh, I do appreciate it. Any ideas you have? For videos or content or format anything really i'm open to uh, hearing what you have to say if you are a subscriber to my channel i do thank you and uh if you're not you need to ask yourself a serious question why not why am i not subscribed to this man's channel and the answer will come to you you should be so get your beautiful finger and press the subscribe button and i'll see you again very very shortly